Good morning, everyone. Looks like uh, it's time to get started. And uh, as you all probably know, my name's Josh Umber, and uh, we're part of the Track One uh, Legal Advice for Direct Care. So we started our practice almost 10 years ago, and when we did, we needed a good lawyer, but we found Luann instead. Um, you know, take what you can get. Right. 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad name. Uh, that's okay. It's easy for me to say that because my dad's a lawyer, yep. He used to be a trash man, but I still tell people he's a trash man because it's less embarrassing. <laughs> exactly, that joke works every time. It's uh, so old it though. It is, it's, it's very old. Um, <laughs> but but uh, my dad and Luann actually went to law school together, so they had a, a great track record. And uh, when we said, we really need someone who can think through a new problem, something that hasn't been done before, um, do it in a way that protects physicians but is fair to patients, that isn't 50 pages long and, and, but gets the, the job done, um, my dad recommended we use Luann. And, and she's been fantastic. She's passionate about the movement. She's helped hundreds of doctors now. Uh, both with their own kind of patient contracts, but with all kinds of other things along the way. Uh, whether that's getting out of a hospital contract, looking at non-competes. Um, you know, now I think she's become an amazing advocate for physicians. Her husband was a physician for 25, 30 years. She really understands what it means to be a physician and that we don't have a, a corporate you know, behemoth behind us to help protect us and, and support these giant legal bills. So how do we punch above our weight class and, and get all the legal help we need so that we're safe to practice the way we want, uh, but without breaking the bank? Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Luann. We'll, we'll give a speech. We'll try to jump in and, and share our thoughts along the way, uh, but we'll also try to open it up for Q&A. Today's really the day where the more questions you ask, the more you get out of it because as you're in your specific spot and, and you, you're trying to move forward and, and finalize all the pieces, um, then you take advantage of all the expert speakers to, to get you through this next question and phase. So, all right, round of applause for Luann. Good morning. I'm re I am really happy to be here, and I, I first I do want to thank Dr. Lee Gross and Doctors for Patient Care for allowing me to be here, asking me to come. Um, I'm really, really am passionate about DPC, and I, as much as this pains me to compliment Josh, um, he really taught me what badassery is, as you know, in being a doc, and 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 just like stepping out of the box, not you know what. We got this problem and that problem, and they're never going to let us do that. And we have to, you know, sign this agreement. What are we going to do? The big hospitals are coming after us. But each time, there was an answer to this. Was step by step answering all the problems, getting them fixed, and all of the other docs that Josh has been associated with, and all of you are going to be the same way because that's what you can do. I think that the um, corporate med and the and and, and the, the bureaucracy has it. It, 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 it pays for them to make you believe that you can't do things, and you can do it. I re I'm sitting here, when, I, when Josh was sitting here talking to Dr. Gross, I'm sitting here looking around, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in this room, and I'm probably the only person in this room that couldn't explain the Krebs cycle. I'll bet everybody in here can explain. If you can explain the Krebs cycle, you can do all of this, I promise you. So. So what I want to explain today and talk about today are the basic legal challenges and issues that will come up with a startup DPC. Um, and more important, I want to leave you, I'd like to leave you with some tips and some strategies along the way. Um, one word about, as, as Josh said, we welcome conversation, having you jumping in. I understand, from my understanding, the, all of the slides will be downloaded, so you can have those. It doesn't matter if I have to skip some, I'll stay on time. Um, a lot of it is just for your use later on. There are some examples of statutes, that, that sort of thing, or um, I'm sorry, of, of contracts. And most of the issues that you're going to have do, uh, they do come from contract law, so that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about when we talk about the problems. And I, and so 
I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to try to sort of do it along a, a timeline of when the issues come up from the time that you decide you're going to leave your employer and you're going to do this until the time when you have to get your, all of your contracts and your vendors and you know, so forth. So how to, how to handle that. So first, we got to talk about, and if you don't mind, I'm going to come down here because I'm a walker. Um, so making your escape, that's the first thing. And it, it's tough because what's going to happen is you're going to look at your contract and probably maybe for the first time in a lot of years, maybe for the first time ever. And that's, that's really an important step because you're going to, it's going to give you a timeline of when you're going to leave because most likely you're going to see uh, what your notice period is. It's probably anywhere between uh, 60, 90, 120 days. Um, you know, they vary. Uh, the other is uh, any um, tail insurance requirements. And, and usually the employer will be obligated to get your tail insurance. And I tell my docs too, it really protects them. It doesn't protect you that much. They're, no lawyer is going to sue you. If after you leave, they discover something, they're going to go for the deep pocket. They're not going after you. That's why they want you to have tail insurance. But what I would say is make sure that if that's in the contract, that you have that tail insurance before you leave. So the other thing is uh, if there are restrictions on you while you're employed, because some, uh, some contracts will say that you can't do anything that has to do with medical um, care while you're working for them except for the, uh, for the university. So that, you have to be a little bit careful about even doing your website and that, that sort of thing if they see it. And the second thing is restriction, restrictions after you're employed, and that's restrictive covenants. So restrictive, there are some states that don't have them, thankfully, but the ones that do are getting stricter and harsher because with the consolidation of the hospitals, um, they're, they're really overstepping. It's like they'll say, okay, so you can't have a, 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 any um, facility within five miles of any corporate office or facility. Well, if you're talking about Ascension or you're talking about No Mercy or whatever, the, you know, it could be anywhere. So, so uh, but we'll talk about that and what to do about it. I don't think you've had any issues with um, non-competes, right? They wanted you out. I they, think. Yeah, no, I, I, they kicked me out. So <laughs> that's the best part. When you don't have a license, they can't really control you. Um, <laughs> Would you speak to the fact that, that maybe some contracts are easier to get out of? Uh, I think we've had doctors like Jennifer Herder in Topeka where there was a very um, uh, competitive hospital system. In fact, two of the, the, the only two hospitals in the city were on the same block. And, uh, next door to each next other. Next door to each other. So she said, look, if I leave, and, but I leave happy, I'll send my referrals back like I always have. And they wanted that value more than they wanted uh, to fight and hold on to the non-compete she had. So sometimes you have a little bit more leverage. Looking at your contract is one thing, but also what is the, the mode or mood of the hospital? And they might be having a hard enough time in the community that they end up being a little bit nicer, some more, more so than others. And, and they want to preserve their downstream referrals because as much as they will tell you, oh, we don't make any money from the family practice docs, you know, which is that, 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 that's just, we know that's not true. That's such bullshit because what they do, is that my second curse? Yeah, uh -huh, but, um, but both were beautiful, so, I mean. So, but we know that's not true because we know that you're the engine that drives every single thing and all of the dance, so, so you know, if you talk to them, and, and of course you have to be careful because you can't, can't come off as like quid pro quo, which is really popular these <laughs> days. We don't want to do that, but just explain to them. And the other thing is, um, and I'm sure you all know this too, how hard is it to recruit a family practice doc to any hospital or any community? It's real hard. So if you say to them, listen, I, I will help smooth this way. You know, I will, in fact, I'll stay a month later than you're, you, know, you want me to. Or, or, or give them a little something, whatever it is, to make them want to be nice to you the whole time that you're there, first of all, and then not, and you know that they're not gonna come after you. 
And the one situation where I really think that it's important that you get it in writing is if they have a restraining order. And if you look at your contract, and I'm sure a lot of you have signed this, and don't beat yourselves up for signing these things because nobody would know. You just wouldn't expect this. But um, a restraining order, and you can see it, it, this is just an example of one. And in all of these examples, these are from real contracts, different contracts that I've been through. But even if there is a threatened breach, they can close you down with a court order. And it's very, very difficult. There's a high bar to prove that you should be entitled to a, um, to a uh, restraining order because it basically closes you down. You can't, do your, you can't open your practice until after the litigation is, is settled. So how they get around that is that they have you sign this clause that says, I agree, you're going to get horrible harm. So they don't even have to prove all of this stuff. They usually have to prove irreparable harm. They don't have to post a bond, nothing. They get their injunction. So um, if that's in there, then you want to do all of the things we talked about before plus you want to have it in writing. And you don't have to ask them for it in writing because then they're going to go to their, law, their lawyers and then the lawyers are going to have a million reasons why not. What you do is you send them an email and say, um, we're in agreement, right, blah, 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 and so um, no restraining order or any other adverse conditions are going to, uh, are going to, uh, you know, you're not going to unleash any of this stuff on me if I, if I do this. And then they'll just say, yeah, and then that's in writing, so you're good. Yeah, I think that's a great take home is anytime you can get it in writing, maybe some of the conversations are nice just one on one uh, to get the mood of the CEO or, or the lawyer. Uh, but other times, if you can get them to say, no, you can't do X, Y and Z. Um, it, it's very uh, damning to them if they do it wrong, very helpful to you if you can say, well, your email on such and such. Because I, I think this plays in a, in a world we're not all used to. And if there's a good take home message from this, it's you should probably never sign a contract. Um, and because if you need a contract attorney, it, 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 you know, be ready for it. Uh, assume the contract is written against you. And, and uh, we have a very scientific analytical mind where it's A plus B equals C. But in law, it's, it's a game. Um, and so they don't even necessarily have to be right. They just have to drown you in paperwork. So you know, knowing that there's these restrictive covenants in there or other pieces that Luen will talk about really lets you play that game a little bit better. And then as you're hiring or, or moonlighting or, or looking at other contracts, you can start to, to have that mental thought process of, well, that's a little vague. And that gives them a lot of power. And that's all they need. They don't even have to prove that they're right, like medicine. Yeah, your sodium's low, is it? We, we prove it. Uh, law is a little bit more flexible because to win, they just have to slow you down or keep you from opening your practice. So, and, and they have more time, more, more lawyers, more money. Right. And, um, and, so if, and if it's after the fact, again, you just want to be, you want to make them want you and you're giving them something they need so that you can, even though it's after the fact, you've already signed it, you can fix it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so assume that we've got all that straightened out. You're going to leave there. They've agreed when you're going to leave. But what about you want to notify your patients? And th this is, becomes a really sticky issue with a lot of hospitals because they'll say, they'll do two things. They'll say that they're going to notify your patients where you've gone, and they don't. You have somebody call up a week later, and I promise you, the receptionist is going to say, oh, Dr. So-and-so left. We don't know. We can, but we can schedule you with another doc. They'll do that. Or um, they'll just out and out tell you they're not going um, to give it notice. But you need to negotiate this with, your, with the hospital or your employer because almost every state, either the, their medical board or by statute, for public policy purposes, requires that patients be notified of where their physician goes and that they're given a choice of who's going to care for them for continuity of care. So what I suggest is write the letter of notice that you want, the way you want it, first, have it ready, have it in your pocket, go to the employer and say, just matter of fact, no fight, no nothing, you don't have to be aggressive. You know what, I, I, want, I, just, I know we both have this duty, and so I wrote this letter, I would like you to look at it, you know, and you can send it out, or, or I can send it out, and then let them have to negotiate back with you. But, uh, but you should always um, insist that they, um, that they just send a notice. They know they have to. And they may start making noises about solicitation. 
Like if you have your website up there, something will say, oh, when you sign this thing, you can't solicit patients. But there are at least three states, Wisconsin, um, Virginia, and I, I, sorry, I can't remember the third one, that have case law that says uh, information is not advertising. It, you have to specifically go to the person, and then, even when, after you go to them, you have to um, specifically say, please come to me. In other words, if you just go to the person and say, I'm opening this DPC and this new concept and this is what I'm doing, that's not going to be considered um, a solicitation. So, you know, I just know that you're, you're safe there. I think... Sure. No, you're fine. The, so the question was, uh, what happens when the hospital says they told your patients where you're going, but they didn't, basically? Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't think that's unusual. Um, I, I've had a lot of experience with that, where, they, where the hospitals will say that, and then you simply you you call what you you call the hospital first and say, look, I'm, I'm gonna I, I I guess I'll have to call the medical board. I'm not sure what to do. do act like kind of like not totally, but like kind of done. Like I guess I have to call the medical board because I know this is my obligation, and I and you do, and you want you want you want to honor it and say like it's kind of a mess, and I you know maybe there's some problem in the in the office or whatever, and then have them send you. Um, confirmation that they're sending those out, and then check back with your patient. But they'll, you know, they'll do it. If you mention the medical board, they're going to do it. And, and I think that's it. Sometimes the hospital can leverage that bureaucracy against you. We never said we wouldn't. We just haven't yet. Or mm -hmm. oops, we mm -hmm. forgot. We've been meaning to. Um, and, and you look how efficient most hospitals are, anyway. So and you put it, and you put a date on your email. Yeah. And I'm I'm really great, as you notice. I always say do it in email because it doesn't seem as aggressive to them, but it has all of the, the power of a legal document. Yeah. So so then you trust but verify with the hospital. Play nice at times, but you can mm. always lean on the medical board and say I need help with X Y Z because they're always looking for somebody, Something. and they'd rather go after a bigger hospital than a one-off doctor. Um, so, times to play nice, times to lean into it a little bit. Um, so, the so question was, is there a statute of limitations on, on how long the hospital can wait before sending that type of oh, information? Oh, yes, no, the yeah. hospital is supposed, they can't wait till after you leave. The hospital is supposed to give them 30, at least 30 days notice. It's just like the patient abandonment uh, laws. Yes. So then you call your medical board and let the medical board handle them. So they need to do it before Unless it's not possible for them to do that. And the only reason it wouldn't be possible is if they weren't notified that you were leaving in, within 30 days. So if you had a heart attack and, and decide you're not coming back, you know, and, and they had under 30 days, it, there, that'd be, you know. And then after you leave, let's say they didn't do it, do they have a period of time that they have to do it within? A reasonable, I hate this language, it's a very weasel word, but a reasonable amount of time. But um, I think yeah, I'm 30, reasonable. 30, <laughs> yeah, I think 30 days That's is probably going to be probably going to be it, right? And part of that is how much of the game do you want to play? I mean, we, you, know, you can get a great lawyer who's a bulldog and start pushing there for you, but they know also how much time and money do you have. So and it's how much of that game do you want to and play? And what's it going to get you? What right. they're supposed to do and what they actually do. Right. Yes, sir? So, yeah, uh, the hospital that I work at, uh, the EMR system, it doesn't have, like, who their current primary care is. The, there was one, his, uh, the primary care physician had retired six months ago. The patients got moved to another patient, and it still had the old primary care physician on the EMR. So even if I, you know, I absorbed his patients, but then when I'm leaving, it still has the old physician as their primary care. So they may not even be capable of sending like letters to who your, prim your primary care is And they're not going to be held responsible for that if they are not capable of it. But as the primary care doc, you are, they, they would be obligated to allow you to go through the records and pick out your patients, and if mm. you can identify them, then they'll send them you, to you. Two years of your schedule yeah. or something, so yeah. that they Within can't two, stop right. you from it's doing It's two years, anything. right. So, all right, so, so assuming we're through all that, now you're ready to start your practice, and the first thing you want to do is create your entity. 
and you want to, because you want to create your entity before you sign any contracts for anything, any leases, any vendors agreements, anything like that, because we all know that there's no uh, liability protection for professional liability, but there is liability protection for, not that this is ever going to happen to anybody that's in DPC, but suppose you go out of business or, uh, you know, any, there's a cat catastrophe. You don't want your, to be responsible for your lease for that whole year personally. You don't want, you don't want to be responsible for um, employee lawsuits personally, all that stuff. So you want to have your entity in place and then you sign all of your agreements in the name for the entity. So it'll say, you know, Josh Umber LLC, PLLC, but, and then you will sign it Dr. Josh Umber for, and then, so that's why you want, you definitely want to do that first. And again, the requirements vary from state to state. Some states require that it's a professional uh, corporate, a PC or a PLLC, some don't. Some require that only physicians can be shareholders. And some allow mid-levels or somebody within the, a licensed medical profession to group together. So you have to you know, check on that. Um, and, and I think that's a good point because every now and then, you know, we see a case who says, I have a, a, a benevolent friend who wants to help me get this, you know, going. They, they have several businesses. They want to help. They want to be a partner in it. But then they haven't looked to see if that state allows the, the corporate practice of medicine. So if you get started on that wrong foot and you have to do everything over again, you just, it's expensive and frustrating. So it's sometimes easiest to... to even though we don't like leaning into the legal stuff, it's, it's pretty well mapped out for most of DPC, so it's, it's best to do it right the first time. Right. And some, uh, Kansas, um, there are a couple of other states that require um, a, that, you, that you get a letter of good standing, a certificate of good standing from the board, the medical board. Um, Kansas is pretty good. Like, I can basically walk it over to the, to Boha, to the Board of Healing Arts, and they'll sign it for me. In New York, um, it, it can be anywhere from three to six months. It's really, uh, it takes a long time, and I, I don't know why that is, but it is. Um, and so, and the, the last thing is, um, if, you're the, if you're a sole member, um, and I hate saying this, but you can use legal Zoom. I mean, you can basically, it, it's not a big deal. Um, I would actually get my CPA to do it because the CPA can tell you, you know, do you want S Corp, do you want, you know, LLC. But if you have more than one shareholder or member, you need to get a good local attorney that does this all the time because it's a prenuptial agreement. Everything, you want everything laid out in there. How are you going to wind up? Who can buy in? How do you buy in? How do you, you know, buy out? All the, there are a lot of issues that are involved in, in that. So you want to make sure that you get a good lawyer if you have more than one member. And it's like any prenup. You know, this is the happy phase where you're yeah. you know, pre-marriage and you don't want to think about it breaking up and, and this is your buddy. And, um, but you know, life happens and that's not to say it'll, it'll go bad, but you know, someone's family has a major event and a doctor has to move away. You plan on these relationships um, dissolving, hope they never do, but a really good attorney will plan all that out for you. And I, having a, the often more painful discussion, all right, who's really doing what? Who, who has the responsibilities? Who's going to put in 60% of the money and 40% and of the sweat equity? Um, who's going to take home 60% of the profit? Who's, Are you going to switch manage, being managing member, you know, switch off every year? It's so it's easier gonna... uh, to say, hey, we'll just figure it out on the fly. Um, but then you get in there and realize, okay, one partner's not showing up for five or 10 hours a week. And so I'm answering all the phones there. And we thought we were both going to be 40 hours a week. And all those assumptions will really eat at you later. So I would say, you know, have a few hour brainstorming session. What are all the possible things we could be thinking of if, if you're doing a partnership? Um, and your lawyer should be devil's advocate too and yeah. saying like, oh, what about this? What about that? You know, and so... It gives you the foundation that going forward, everything will be much easier. Otherwise, you get into this and you've got two or three months of accounts receivable. You've got somebody paid for the Xerox, but now they haven't seen as many patients. They, they want, uh, but they thought they did all the marketing. And if you haven't lined that out, then it gets really messy later on. Um, so uh, again, start on a very good foundation. So, all right, now you've got your entity. Now uh, you've got decisions to make. Well, actually, you probably made these decisions before, but let's talk about like what 
the practice um, model that you're gonna have, because DPC, there's so many different um, ways that DP, DP, people practice DPC. So um, obviously the three main models would be pure DPC, which in a perfect world, that's the best thing and I'm all for it. Per, pure DPC, that your, your overhead is low, it's simple, simple, simple. And that's how we can all afford to do, this is how you guys can afford to do this because you keep your overhead low and everything's simple. You don't want a lot of administrative stuff. Pure DPC is great for that. Um, the second one um, is the hybrid model. And some people, some docs, especially if you, they've been in practice for a lot of years and they have all these insurance patients or Medicare patients, they may not be ready for it and they want to do the hybrid. And I understand that and some people have to do it. I am very biased against it because I think that um, there's no, absolutely no reduction in your overhead. In fact, I think there's more because you have to run two different almost sets of books just to just because of the, you know, the, the insurance people. You don't want to commingle anything, Medicare and insurance. Um, and then you have the added, like I, I always um, I always do the analogy of um, when I had my first daughter, um, I got a, I got an epidural. I was thinking, oh, I don't know if I want an epidural, so I'm gonna be all numb and blah blah. So I decide to get it because I'm a sissy and I get it. But it takes only on one side. This sucks. And I can't, you can't even imagine. Because I'm like, okay, this is cool. I can't even get up, stand up, and walk to the bathroom. But yet, I'm in horrible pain. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and that's what I think of with a hybrid DPC. You know, because you. It's like you, half an epidural. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> so, you, you know, you've got, you've got all the record keeping, all the, all the uh, compliance crap. You've got all that of the insurance part, but yet you're expected to be there for your DPC patients and spend all that extra time and know who they are. And so it, I, I just kind of think it's the worst of both worlds. But, but you and, know. And back to a lot of this is contract law, and we don't have a whole lot of experience reading contracts, and then the insurance contracts are massive, but people will say, well, can I do X, Y, or Z? Well, it depends on your contract. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, if you've signed a new one, they might, uh, Blue Cross in Kansas, a few other states, says you can't do a DPC model as well. They all say that. Yeah. Almost all of them say that. But again, one other thing is that when it comes down to it, at least my experience, once they push back, well, okay, fine, then we're just going to leave. And well, no, you have a 190 day notice. Well, okay, but we're just leaving. Well, what's the punishment for that? We're throwing you off the panel. It's like, Oh Thank no! You. <laughs> Don't do that. So, so it's kind of, it's kind of weird. But but well, you, every but now Josh and then you can right. poke the bear and win. So. Well, for macro and MIPS, they, they've, um, there's a lower threshold, and I'm sorry, I can't think what if it's 200 or it might be it might be less than that. But you still have all the other stuff. It doesn't matter. You still have Stark. You still have anti kickback. You still have just everything else. If if you were gonna do, if you were gonna take one or the other, honestly, I would rather do the private insurance than Medicare because Medicare is your real. I mean, that's where all of those breaks come in. And we can always kind of talk about the nuances of that transition phase. Mm -hmm. There's good, better, best kind of thing where I can't get out of Medicare just mm -hmm. yet because of the moonlighting job I have, uh, et cetera. How right, right, and, and I'll come into that. And the other thing is I'm not putting down people who have to do hybrid practice because it is, you can do that. You, you can do it. It's just not ideal. It's more complicated. But this isn't an ideal world, so, you know, it, it, it can be done. You'd still have to participate with Medicare to get paid by Medicare. Yes. Right. I, I know. But, so you, but the most onerous one, my understanding was that you don't have to. But I, I know that's just well, it, but you're, you're still, you're, you still have to comply with all the fraud and abuse, anti-kickback, all that stuff. Yeah. You're not. No. If you're just doing pure DPC and you're not taking any money from the government or insurance. No, you are not subject to Stark or anti kickback. There's kind of, there, there are some indirect ways that you might somehow 
um, violate anti-kickback, but and we can talk about that later. But that's really involved. So yeah. basically, the, the answer is no, nor HIPAA, nor HIPAA. And the problem with taking Medicare is then you couldn't take any Medicare age patients that want the membership. So you'd have to choose one or the other. A bit of a business decision. Yeah. Um, over here, and then back to the mic. Right now we have insurance based practice. It's the LLC. You're, you're, you're good with the private insurances because, like we were just saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So the question was if uh, you have a group of three doctors, but the contract with the insurance is signed by the entity, the, the LLC, and not by the individual physicians. So we have a contract with all these insurance companies, including Medicare, but they're all under... Our group is Austin Medical Group. We're in Austin. Go figure. But the, the DPC entity is a totally different PLLC, different TINs, so we're not overlapping any of them. Right. So one provider is going to stay 100% insurance until enough patients are, are transferring over, and we have enough volume. So we have some sort of uh, money coming in. So my question really is, when we do the hybrid model, the, we're keeping two separate records because they're two separate EMRs. We're not trying to cross and commingle and try to figure out the mess that it's going to cause later. We're just trying to practice some two totally separate things. Right. And phone you, number's the same, but that's the only thing. They pick up the phone and patient calls and are you DPC or are you insurance? And then you kind of open that EMR. And that's the way we're trying to do it, but I'm just trying to get some feedback from you guys on is that okay? And you can do that, except for with Medicare, don't forget, the, the private insurances, it'll work, yeah. the fact that you have different, you, you know, it's under your um, uh, corporate um, name, mm -hmm. EIN, but with Medicare, you have to personally, it's do, a position, it's, yeah. yeah, you have to sign, you have to opt out. Okay, but so. if we choose to not opt out, and because we're hybrid, we're still seeing Medicare, as long as we don't charge them a membership fee, and we just keep doing Medicare as just, Medicare. Billing them Medicare, and then well, I'll talk about in a minute. We're going to come to um, the urgent care and emergent <clears throat> emergent care exception, where I think might benefit you too, because if you needed coverage, and we'll talk about that, and it's coming up. In, just like, in some ways, the Medicare hybrid at least makes more sense because it's one insurance. But then you get into the private insurance conversation, and it could be you know any one of hundreds of different contracts. So one predictable contract versus one contract that could be different for every clinic. Right. So and the so then the, the third one, and this is and this works for a lot of people. It's um, a, the traditional pure DPC as well as a cash pay fee for service, and um, it's, it's good for uh, starting out, especially. To, for cash, if you need some cash flow and you want, um, and, and, and maybe the patients, it's a new concept in your area, it's a great way for the patients to see how, what, it, what it is. The great thing about DPC is you don't have to sell it. They see it and they love it. And so they might go for two or three fee-for-service visits and they realize, geez, you know, like I'm, 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 they make that much better if I, you know, join as a member. Um, so, and then there's no, there's no billing issue or compliance because you're not doing any billing. You're getting, you're taking their credit card when they come in, they're going to pay time of service. So you're not increasing any of your administrative overhead. Um, excuse me. I have a question regarding the same sense in the same way that the other um, physician mentioned, but vaccinations. If we have two separate entities like that, and as a pediatrician, I have vaccinations, which I have to if I send my patients to the other entity, which is an established entity to get the vaccines, but it is owned by same physician, is that anti like So the question being, or? one physician with two entities, one being opted out, one being insurance, can the opted out Send the patients for LLC. vaccinations only to the other entity? Send it to, yeah. N not for Medicare. But if it's private insurance, you're employed by those two LLCs. So you're just working as an employee as far as for the insurance companies. Correct. Um, but for the Medicare, no. You, you, okay. If you're opted out, you're, you're opted out. It's all in or all out. All right. Thank you. So, um, and then the next thing, and I, I know we're not getting through these slides. No, that's at all right. All, They're downloaded but, and we'll be around yes, to answer um, more is, questions. Yes, is, is terminating the third party payers. And I think. Um, 
I already kind of went through with the private plans, um, and uh, usually uh, you, now, if you're if you're employed by a big big um, hospital group or even a group, most of the time you're going to be signed at the corporate level, and so you're going to do just what we were saying. You're not you don't even have to do the notice thing, and if you do, like I said, it's like you know. So what's my punishment? <laughs> so. It's easier to get out of that, but there's a time frame to, yeah. to be aware of. Yeah. Medicaid, and that's, thank you, I'm just getting into that, it was perfect, perfect timing. timing. <laughs> yeah. So with Medicaid, um, there were some ACA changes that nobody really paid attention to. I think it was in 2010, and now these past two years, like, they're really pushing it, we have to pay attention to it. And that is that if you want to accept Medicare patients, if you want to privately contract with Medicare patients, you have to be enrolled as a, um, as a prescriber order, order and referral only. And almost every state will have a short form, enrollment form, on their website, and you can just fill that out, and then, the, you, you know, because you have to have your MPI number, and you have to be registered with PICOS. So that's all you do, and then, and you're good for, for Medicaid, except for Kentucky, because they have just this special rule that just doesn't allow um, patients to, there's no private contracting with Medicaid at all, and I'm, I, it's crazy, I think that we need to change it, but, Kentucky's the only one. Um, so so that, that, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. And by the way, I just wanna say about Medicaid patients, I've had some docs that, um, one doc in particular was from um, Louisiana and he was saying like, um, I'm in this area, it's really poor, I, all, my, every, almost my whole um, patient um, uh, panel is Medicaid and um, I don't even know how, how this is gonna work out and everybody's telling me it's gonna be bad working with Medicaid patients. We did it, and about three months later, he called me and he said, I love this, it is so great. The patients are compliant, they love me, because they're paying the same thing that everybody else in that office is paying, and they have to look me in the, in the eye when they bring their children in that have asthma, stuff like that, they, they want me, they wanna make me happy that they, that, I, that they did what I asked them to do. So, they, so they're compliant, he said it's, it really changed his whole attitude and life. So I wouldn't, um, I, I would not be, I wouldn't try to avoid Medicaid. I think, I think, it's, a, I, I think it's a great area to, to get into and I think it does some good things for people. Um, There's a question. Sure. So we've been trying to contact the private insurances to let them know that I will no longer be on their panel. And are they obligated to confirm that? And if they don't take me off their panel and then I start DPC, will there be any repercussions for that? Are, are you talking about private insurances? Yes. yes. No, you won't. there will be no repercussions for you. You've done your duty by giving them notification. Okay. What they do with it is it, did you send it, and oh, that's another thing, you should always send any notices to Medicare, to the private insurances, um, certified return receipt requested. Um, so that would be my next question, did you? Um, A did lot of the private insurances want it done by email. They're, they have a form that oh, well, says, just send me an email. Perfect. All, all we're getting back is, we got your email, thank you. Perfect, That's perfect. All. Okay. You have that, you, yeah, no, so you're good. And again, they may not make it easier. They may not you know, give you exactly what you want, but they also didn't do anything, quote, wrong. So that's that legal game a little bit too that we have to get more aware of mm -hmm. playing. You don't have to have them accept it. This isn't you know, launching a nuclear missile from the submarine where we both have to turn <laughs> our keys. I, I complied with it, I gave you notice, I've got some documentation. You know, always make sure you save those emails. If you, a person who deletes your emails, you're going to delete the yes, evidence that yes, you did Yes, right, this. right. That's yeah. Um, excellent point. So think about those kind of things in the back of your mind. How can I prove this? Right. If I'm, you know, treating somebody with chronic pain meds, I'm, I'm making sure I've documented thoroughly what I'm doing. That same skill set in medicine applies really well to that law. Kind of that trust but verify. If anyone ever, mm -hmm. you know, made me. Um, uh, show documentation that I did this. I, is that I, why I you send that. me those emails and you say, All I'm confirming this, Luann? Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So if you're opting out of Medicare, you're not necessarily opting out of Medicaid. Is that correct or no? Correct. correct. Medicare and Medicaid are separate. And if you're in an employed position, do you have to get a new Medicaid number or what will happen to your Medicaid norm if number? It just follows you? So if you're, if you're employed, um, you're probably enrolled in Medicaid already, right. and it's not the same thing like that you're 
and you're enrolled at the corporate level, that's another like sort of personal thing, but you're probably enrolled, like fully enrolled. So what you would want to do is still go to your state website, and um, I think I have my email on here. I mean, of course, if, I, I can help you if, 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 if your state doesn't have it, but um, go to your state website, and they'll have an abbreviated form, and just redo it anyway, because then okay. they'll enroll, me, enroll you. You'll put your MPI number whenever you do an order prescription or whatever, and the pharmacist or whoever's taking that order, will, when they see that, they know they can fill it. Um, so that it would just, it's just a short form. And you don't have to disenroll from Medicaid? No. Okay. State dependent. Yeah, it is. It's it's it's, it's uh, uh, most of the midwestern states are pretty quick. Most of the coastal states are pretty crappy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, oh, did I go backwards? I went backwards. All right. Opting out of Medicare. Okay, so I just want to say, opting out of Medicare used to be the easiest thing that I did when I would help docs. Is opting out. It's turned into a circus. So, but let me just tell you the, 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 uh, the, the, the basics, and you probably already know this, but I'll just go back through it real quick. Um, you have to file a valid op, um, opt-out affidavit with all of your irrelevant MACs. You probably only have one MAC. That's the, uh, um, the carrier for your Medicare in your area. Um, um, and then if you want to order, and on that affidavit, make sure if you want to order, refer, and prescribe, which of course you do, make sure that you put your social security number and your MPI and that it's clearly on there because they won't tell you. They'll just like take it, accept it, say, oh, fine. And even if they can't read it, even if they can't, they'll just, they'll just, you'll find out when you start sending um, your, your, your patients for imaging or something and it gets denied. So make sure that you do that. Um, and then uh, keep a copy of the beneficiary signed private contract, which is not the same as the patient agreement. And it really is sort of a form. A lot of the carriers have their own form that they want. Some of them say that you need to send that in and with the affidavit, and some don't. I always have them send both in because they change their minds about everything all the time. So if they have the, the, um, a, the agreement, then that's one less thing you have to worry about. They're not going to punish you for sending it, so, so send that in. Um, and then here's, where, here's the rub. The opt-out effective date depends on your participation status with Medicare. And I know that every single person in this room knows what PAR and non-PAR is, right? If you're participating, you're accepting the, um, the allowable, the, you're billing Medicare, and Medicare is sending you the, your, your allowable amount. If you don't participate, you can charge maybe 5% over the allowable, but the um, patient gets the reimbursement, and you have to collect it from the patient, and you're only getting 95% of the allowable. That's the rule. It's been the rule, and it's always the rule. But, um, and, so, and so, so if you're a participating provider, and under those rules that I just mentioned, um, then your opt-out affidavit, and I, I really love this, because like, who's, I want to know who these like bureaucrats are that sit in this freaking room, mm -hmm. and they decide, what can we do to screw with them, okay? <laughs> Uh, what does this, uh, the opt-out affidavit must be received by the first day of the month before the quarter that you want the opt-out to be effective. Yeah. Ah, like why, why is that? So anyway, but that's for, participate, for participating providers. If you're non-PAR, whenever you, the date that you've signed the um, affidavit is the date that it's effective. And you can, and you, you can send it up to 10 days after you got your first patient agreement. So the problem with this is that um, some of the MACs, um, which I can't remember the one in California, that's my biggie right now. They are, um, how much time do we have? Oh, about we're 10 minutes. Done. Oh, we're, yeah. we're never getting through. <laughs> okay, some of the MACs will say that, you're, say, say that if you have assigned your benefits, your payment to like a hospital, it, it's not your own practice, that you are, they're gonna treat you as if you're non-par. So then you can opt out easier. But it's not a good deal because if you don't know and you send it in, they opt you out immediately oh. and then your employer is going to go crazy <laughs> because all of the claims are going to be rejected. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yes, Dr. Rostick. I, we, I, <laughs> that, was, that was the first of my nightmares, actually. She started it. <laughs> so it's um, her fault. Don't do that. Yeah. So... Um, 
So, so what do you do? So, so you, you need to definitely go into Picos and check and see what your uh, participation status is. If you're still not sure, call your Mac for confirmation and get somebody's name. Get somebody you can go back to because it can be a real pain because you have to you have to disenroll, re-enroll. It's it, it, uh, Dr. Austin can tell you. Um, so. Um, you know, just 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 like I said, make sure that there that that you, that you do have have a name have a name of somebody. And again, the legal implications of opting out is it's mandatory for two years. You can't opt back in. Uh, you can't bill Medicare for any um, any services that you provide except for what we'll talk about in a second if we have time. Yeah. The, okay. Um, and neither can any. And this is important. Neither can any other person or entity bill under their name, because I have had so many docs come in and their employer says, oh, it's okay, to Medicare, we're going to bill under our number and you'll provide the services. You can't do that. That's fraud. And I don't think they do it on purpose. I think they don't know. So just remember that. Is there a question? Um, Picos and Mac. Oh, okay. Mac or what oh, do they mean? Oh, okay, sorry. So, yeah, so, so, so um, Mac is the Medicare Administrative Carrier, no, ad Medicare Administrative, something, something. I forget. <laughs> and Picos is the um, uh, supply. It, I, I honestly can't remember what it means, but it, but it, what it says is it's the supply chain. It's the enrollment. It's 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 the uh, entity that enrolls uh, all the docs when they enroll in Medicare, and they have records of what your status is. So um, it's supply. Yeah, PICOS is for ordering and prescribing, not for um, payment from Medicare. No, it's just, it's just, and it's just, a, it's, it, and it, if you go on there, it will tell you every place you've worked and what your status was. And I'm so embarrassed because I can't remember what it, and I just looked it up last yeah, night. If I, could, if I could just ask a question, I just want to know, as far as for Medicare, I, I work for the behemoth in my town. Is my Medicare assigned to the behemoth hospital? Or is Medicare, uh, do I have a Medicare, a personal Medicare number assigned to me only, even though I work for them? Are you, are, are you talking about your, your, um, your, your, your identification number, your Medicare identification number? There's only one number, that would be yours, yes, and it's only to you, okay, so your despite, MPI. Despite, okay, so despite I work for the, for the big hospital, I have my own number that is assigned to Medicare. Right, you have, you have a national provider um, okay. Question identifier. Two. Question two, if I have Medicare patients come and follow me, can I prescribe, can I, how do I refer, how to, how does that entity work? The ability to write prescriptions, lab orders, referrals for a Medicare patient when you've opted out goes through your PCOS. So as, as any provider who has either opted in or opted out and has PCOS can do all of those things. So they won't pay you for it, but you can still do it. And, and they'll pay the they'll pay the pharmacy. They'll pay the they'll pay the imaging company. Because in that sense, the pharmacy is the Medicare participating provider who's going to get paid, or the hospital or the lab. Because that's right, what Medicare I, patients working. get. They get nervous. They're like, "What am I going to do if I need this or that? You know, like I need lab work." It's fine because you're you're going to be um, you're going to be enrolled as a as a prescriber, and you can do that. Okay, great. Yes. I'll put the asterisk on that though. No, yeah, ordering, providing, yeah. referral. It, the asterisks of Medicare will pay for it if they want to. So I tell patients... But if it's a covered Medicare yeah, service. You're still in that world. Anytime you ask Medicare to pay for something, they're going to say yes or no. So yes, well, you can prescribe it. doesn't mean they'll necessarily cover it. Um, that, you're just back in the traditional Medicare rules. Uh, and I yeah. think we're over our time. On that note, few, do you recommend using ABN? What? what? The I'm advanced, sorry? advanced beneficiary notice, the ABN that we give to Medicare patients to say we've no idea if they're going to cover this? Uh, no, you don't have to give them an ABN because it is because the ABN is when you know or you suspect Medicare won't cover it. But, but the assumption is if it's a lab test, if it's, if it's a prescription, if it's imaging, if it's something that you're ordering, that's going to be covered by Medicare. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I just want to... Quickly, quickly, if I can just go over the, um, the uh, emergent and urgent care exception, because there are a lot of things that you can do and if you can't opt out of Medicare yet. And one is you can work in an ER or an urgent care. 
And the, uh, the statute has been, it, it, it's in the statute that it is meant to be broadly construed. In other words, and it's not emergent care like you think of it, or urgent care. They, they gave an example like uh, if someone comes in with an earache, that's something you could see. If there is no other Medicare opted in physician available to see that patient, an opted out physician can see them, and then they'll get 95% of, uh, of Medicare. And often, like I've had to talk to employers sometimes, it takes a little while because they're like really nervous about it, but it can be done. So you can work in an urgent care or an ER and be opted out. Yeah. And that gives a lot of doctors the startup capital they need to get this launching because if, if you converting a practice to starting a practice, you have zero patients, then you have a lot of time for moonlighting and, and to fill in the gaps. But then as you make that transition, I have more of my own patients, I need less moonlighting until uh, I'm fully done with that uh, additional work. So some, uh, sometimes that's an excellent way to fund your own business. I can't hear it. Um, the good lawyer's answer is always it depends. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but let me just say it's not enforced. Um, it happens all the time. I mean, you're not sending a bill. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, it used to be, it used to be much a bigger deal. They used to talk about it all the time, and now they're sort of saying, like, especially according to your, what MAC that you have, like our MAC, like in Pennsylvania, um, they're like saying, or not Pennsylvania, Kansas, is saying, like, you, we're not going to go after that. I, I, it's just not something I think that. Let me just tell you. I'll say this: If it was my husband, I would say, just go treat them. You know, you're not billing Medicare. You're not doing anything fraudulent, and they're visitors. So it's not somebody that you are um, trying to um, encourage to, to come to you as a provider. Yeah. You know, they're, so. they're looking at that as the, the return on investment too. So if you're doing this for 10 Medicare patients a day and billing outside of that, yeah, we might go look at that. The occasional one-off, you know, even a good, uh, even a bad attorney's fee is going to be $200 an hour, That's right. let alone a good. So they're, they're going to look at that. So you gave free care away. There was nothing malicious about it. Uh, you know, don't worry about those and, and, and the last thing that I just want to, I just want to, for, for docs to get, because I know this used to make me really nervous. And I've worked with um, uh, whistleblower cases and, and, and fraud and abuse like for Medicare. And I can tell you that the, besides what everybody says, but they're really looking for these U.S. attorneys want to have a beautiful headline. So you doing some little thing like this, it's not, it's not they, 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 they want to spend their money where they're going to get a really big DME dealer that's doing all this crap, or a doctor who has an, uh, an opiate uh, mill. So you can, I mean, you really should relax a little bit about that. I'm not saying, you know, just go crazy and don't, don't you know, abide by anything, but, but don't let this keep you up at night. But the headline of nice Texas doctor helps sick, you know, yeah. elderly patient. It's great. It, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's so, marketing. I say do that more um, often. Yeah. So um, I, so we, so I, there, there are more slides and I, um, you can go through them. Um, you, there'll be, they will be, uh, posted, I think, in 30 days. Um, a lot of them are self-explanatory. A lot of them are just um, sample contract um, sort of uh, clauses that you might want to use or incorporate into your patient agreement. And some are things that I, you need to look out for. And if you have any questions, you can um, always call me. And I'll be around here today, too, so as well as Josh. I think that take-home message is, is lean into the legal stuff. It's very intimidating for us as physicians. We, we, I think can see ourselves, our, our patients in this role, where patients are afraid to get an MRI because they don't know what it costs and, and they heard it could be $3,000. And then we talk to other physicians who say, yeah, I spent 5000 on a contract review and I still don't know what it means. So we're like, well, I'll just not spend any money and hope I figure it out. But that often puts us in a, in a precarious position. So we have enough help in this DPC community. Luann's absolutely amazing. Other l lawyers have been helpful. Phil's Phil Eskew. Oh helpful. my gosh, and please yeah. use his DPC Frontier page. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So don't, don't pull away from that. And everything you've done up until this point is so much harder than this. Yeah. I mean, I can do this. So you can do this. This is not hard. Yeah. So. Fantastic. All right. Um, I think that's all our time. Yeah, Thank I you all very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.
I'm happy to answer your question. Yeah. Got time for a quick question uh, about the emergency exemption. So I'm a rural doc working at a small rural hospital. Currently, I provide ER coverage along with my current partners. If I were to opt out, and a lot of our patients are Medicare, that would already be existing patients of mine or my partners. There's a line there that mentions it, emergency services are covered if nobody else is available if there was no previous agreement. Right. And that, okay, so what so I So would I be, would my hospital be able, to, if I were to opt out and then continue to moonlight as an ER doc in my current hospital, as an opted out physician, would my hospital be able to bill for those Medicare patients that were previously could seen bill, by my clinic? Could bill for those patients that you see as long as they're not your DPC patients. Because if they're your DPC patients, they're going to be covered under the DPC agreement anyway. So it doesn't matter if they were my previous Medicare patient when I was enrolled in Medicare? No, no. The, the only thing that that's talking about is where are they your DPC patients now?